We're asked to consider the setup in figure 3.13 with mass one equal two kilograms, mass two equals one kilogram, spring constant K1 equals four newtons per meter, and spring constant K2 equals two newtons per meter. We'll also let X1 equal the displacement of mass one, and X2 equal the displacement of mass two. To set up the system, we'll be using the equations, force equals the spring constant K times the spring compression X. The force will be positive or negative based upon the direction of the force, and we'll also use force equals mass times acceleration. Let's begin by considering mass one. For the first equation on the left, we have mass one times the acceleration of mass one given by X1 double prime. This is equal to the sum of the forces of the springs acting on mass one. So let's first consider spring one. As mass one moves to the right, notice spring one is stretched, and therefore the force will pull it back to the left, resulting in a negative force. So the force being applied to mass one from spring one is equal to negative K1 times X1, where K1 is a spring constant, and X1, which is a displacement of mass one, is the same as how much the spring is stretched. And then we have plus, analyzing spring two, as mass one moves to the right, spring two is compressed, and the force will be applied to the right, giving a positive force equal to the spring constant K2 times the difference of X2 and X1. The difference of X2 and X1 is the amount spring two is compressed. And this should make sense. For example, if mass two is displaced four units, and mass one is displaced three units, then spring two would only be compressed by four minus three, or one unit. And now for the second equation, we consider mass two. On the left, we have mass two times acceleration, given by x two double prime, equals on the right. The only spring affecting mass two is spring two. As mass two moves to the right, spring two is stretched, and therefore it'll pull back to the left, giving a negative force equal to negative K two times the amount spring two is stretched, which is given by the difference of X two and X one. From here, we substitute the given values, where for the first equation, M one is equal to two, K one is equal to four, K two is equal to two. In the second equation, M two equals one, and again, K two equals two. Next, we simplify the right side of both equations and combine like terms resulting in the two equations at the bottom. We have two x one double prime equals negative six x one plus two x two, and x two double prime equals two x one minus two x two. Now we write the system as an equation in the form of m times x double prime equals k times x, where m is the two by two matrix with the entries of two and one along the main diagonal, which are the coefficients of x one double prime and x two double prime, and then we have times vector x double prime equals on the right, we have matrix K, which contains the coefficients of x one and x two. This gives us the two by two matrix with entries negative six, two, two, and negative two times vector x. Now we want to solve this equation for vector x double prime by multiplying both sides of the equation by the inverse of matrix M. Because matrix M is a diagonal matrix, we can determine the inverse of matrix M by simply taking the reciprocals of the entries along the main diagonal, which are shown here on the right. Multiplying both sides by M inverse, and setting M inverse times K equal to matrix A, we have vector X double prime equals matrix A, which is the two by two matrix with entries negative three, one, two, negative two, times vector X. And now we'll solve the system in this form. Recall from our previous lesson, we can determine the general solution using the theorem below, or let A be a real n by n matrix with n distinct real negative or zero eigenvalues, we denote by negative omega one squared greater than negative omega two squared, and so on all the way out to greater than negative omega sub n squared, and corresponding eigenvectors v one through v n. If A is invertible, then x of t shown here is the general solution of vector x double prime equals A times vector x, for some arbitrary constants, a sub i and b sub i. If a has a zero eigenvalue, that is omega one equals zero, and all their eigenvalues are distinct and negative, then we use the x of t below for the general solution. So our next step is to determine the eigenvalues of the two by two matrix, matrix A. To do this, we set up the equation of the determinant 
of the difference of matrix A and lambda times I equals zero, which we have below. Next we simplify, which gives us a determinant of the two by two matrix with entries negative three minus lambda, one, two, and negative two minus lambda. Now we evaluate the determinant, set it equal to zero, and solve for lambda, which I've already done here. Notice how the result is factorable. This gives us lambda sub one equals negative one, and lambda sub two equals negative four. This also indicates negative omega one squared equals negative one, and negative omega two squared equals negative four. And therefore, omega one equals one, and omega two equals two. Notice how we'll need these values for the general solution. And now we determine corresponding eigenvectors. To do this, we set up the equation, the difference of matrix A and lambda I times vector V equals a zero vector, and determine a vector V. For lambda sub one equals negative one, here we have the setup. Simplifying inside the parentheses, we have the two by two matrix with entries negative two, one, two, negative one, times vector V equals a zero vector. Recall we have an infinite number of solutions, and therefore we can determine a corresponding eigenvector by considering just one of the equations. If I consider the first equation, we have negative two V one plus V two equals zero, which we can write as V two equals two V one. So if we let V one equal one, V two equals two, giving us the eigenvector V one equal to the vector one two. And now we do the same for lambda sub two equals negative four. Here's the setup, simplifying. Using the first equation, we have V one plus V two equals zero, or V one equals negative V two. If we let V two equal negative one, notice V one is one, let's let the corresponding eigenvector V two be the vector one, negative one. And now we have all the information we need to determine the general solution. Because we have two negative eigenvalues, we use the first formula for the general solution. This indicates that x of t is equal to the eigenvector v1 times the sum of a1 cosi t and b1 sine t. Notice how the inputs into cosine and sine are t because lambda one is equal to one. And then we have plus the eigenvector v2 times the sum of a2 and cosine two t and b2 sine two t. Notice here the inputs are two t because omega two is two. So this is the general solution. The two terms in the solution represent the two so-called natural or normal modes of oscillation. The two angular frequencies are the natural frequencies. The first natural frequency is one, given by omega one, and the second natural frequency is two, given by omega two. The two modes are plotted below. In the left plot, the masses are moving in unison. In the right plot, the masses are moving in the opposite direction. So again, the general solution is a combination of the two modes. That is, the initial conditions determine the amplitude and phase shift of each mode. As an example, let's suppose we have the initial conditions, x of zero equals the vector one, negative one, and x prime of zero equals the vector zero, six. Beginning with x of zero equals the vector one, negative one, we substitute zero for t in the general solution and set it equal to the vector one, negative one. So here's the setup. Again, I substituted zero for t, and now we simplify the sines and cosines, and then multiply. The result is the two by one matrix with entries a1 plus a2 and two a minus a2, which must equal the vector one, negative one. And now we solve the system to determine a1 and a2. One way to do this would be to set up an augmented matrix and write it in reduced row echelon form, which I've done here. This gives us a1 equals zero and a2 equals one. And now we can substitute these values into the general solution. Notice a1 cosine t will drop out, giving us x of t shown below. Before we use the next initial condition, we need to find x prime of t, which I've done here at the bottom. And now we use x prime of t in the second initial condition to determine b1 and b2. Let's do this on the next slide. So again, we now substitute zero for t into x prime of t and set it equal to the vector zero, six. Simplifying the sines and cosines, we end up with the two by one matrix with entries b1 plus two b2 and two b1 minus two b2 equals the vector zero, six. And now again, we solve the system using an augmented matrix and writing it in reduced row echelon form, we end up with b1 equals two and b2 equals negative one. And now we sub these values into x of t, which gives us our particular solution shown below. 
and it can be expressed in either of these two forms. Before we go, let's look at the graphs of the two displacements. Below we have the graphs of the two displacements, x1 and x2, where we have x1 of t equals 2 sine t plus cosine 2t minus sine 2t, which is graphed in blue, and then in green we have x2 of t equals 4 sine t minus cosine 2t plus sine 2t. I hope you found this helpful.